Welcome to Avid Learning's second round table brought to you in collaboration with the Italian Embassy Cultural Center, Mumbai. This is part of Avid's larger focus on design this month, which also includes a workshop on service design that was held this past Saturday and conducted by Sudhir Bhatia of Brand Studio. Today's roundtable takes a closer look at design innovation and trends with a special emphasis on Indian and Italian practices and products. The discussion will feature product interior designer and partner of Studio Creo Delhi, Pier Francesco Arnone, architect, designer and founder of the Studio Lab, Shonan Puri Trehan, architect and interior designer, Rushad Shroff, and architect and interior designer Rajiv Thakkar, who will also anchor the conversation. Welcome to our panelists. Uh, I'd like to invite you to please refer to the bio handouts that have been given to you for more on each of them. Uh, these experts will discuss a variety of design-related topics, including their contributions to and opinions on multidisciplinary and innovation design in the fields of product design, interiors, furniture, and architecture. I'd now like to invite our first presenter, Pier Francesco, to come up. Hi, everybody. So, uh, I'm Pier Francesco, and came from uh, Italy, and uh, I'm an architect, interior designer, and uh, product designer. Uh, I work um, have my office in uh, in Italy, but also I work here in uh, Delhi. Like partner for Studio Creo is an office uh, uh, that work with uh, a different kind of uh, product. We represent a different product uh, that came from Italy, and also uh, um, we have also the, the production for uh, different kind of uh, furniture, and uh, we. Uh, design interior, we designed uh, a solution for residential and uh, um, office and all. Uh, in this moment, we just work for a big project in uh, Bangalore, so I'm here and go and come back from India several times because uh, I just followed the project in, uh, in Bangalore about the township, the name is uh, Bartia City. Okay. Um, in this moment, I here because uh, um, I, I say thank you to the uh, management for uh, inviting me, and uh, uh, I explain you my work like uh, uh, product designer. Uh, this product designer that uh, uh, I do came from uh, a different kind of company, that uh, an Italian company. Uh, because I work with them uh, in, the, in my office there. And uh, uh, this company um, that worked with me usually um, selected this kind of a product that I produce and I design for them by brief or sometimes because I uh, only suggest my idea. Uh, my uh, work on, uh, in product design start uh, around uh, 14 years before. Uh, my, first, uh, uh, my first project is this. As a cork stool, I showed the first time in the International Furniture Fair in Milano. Uh, there is the space in Milano for the young designer that won't show their, their job. The name is Salone Satellite. It's a space uh, where uh, um, the young guys go there and uh, start to show uh, the design, the uh, idea for the company that uh, are present in the International Furniture Fair. And maybe they won't catch one uh, looking for the new concept, the new idea. So uh, I take part for, um, uh, for the Salon Satellite uh, 14 years before with this project and um, more order. But uh, uh, this was the first uh, my project that have a big success, especially for uh, the um, uh, publication, for the idea, for uh, the concept. A lot of people like it, but the idea is very simple because it's only the um, pop art idea. Change the dimension is uh, like a cork stool, change, cork uh, uh, wine, change the dimension, become a stool. The product that I use is uh, a concrete, is a uh, uh, cork, all cork. Don't use the order. The quality of the cork is uh, the high quality. Don't have too much glue inside, so we can consider this a product like a sustainable product. Inside, there is only the five percent of glue. Other is the natural glue that the cork uh, release when uh, uh, going heat. 
So uh, the product then uh, uh, involved because they create also the cage. So we have two stools in only one pieces. And uh, we just start for uh, producing with myself. Then uh, one company started to see that it's interesting that people stay there and see this product, want to uh, um, uh, touch the people, want to try. It's very curiosity for, uh, for uh, see this kind of product. And they want uh, uh, to understand more. So in that case, uh, one other company, the name is Franco Light, decided to produce him in polypropylene. Then I show you later. This is another big project that I do with another company. This company I meet in Salone del Salone, Salone del Mobile, and uh, they was uh, curious about my product and uh, giving me a brief, uh, brief. This brief was to create the family lighting. For family lighting means something that uh, is only one shape that I can share in different kind of a solution. In this case, uh, uh, these lamps uh, we can become the floor lamps, table lamps, ceiling lamps, and uh, uh, wall lamps. The idea is uh, simple, but the uh, technical, the engineer that is behind, is was very hard because uh, uh, this lamp is around uh, 2002 when the LED light is not common. Uh, just there are the LED light, but uh, uh, it's very high price. We don't know exactly uh, the, the the success for the LED in the future, so we prefer to use the bulb. So the concept is like the bamboo style. No, the idea is to create the element that I can go up and change the shape, change the dimension. In every my project, I have three items very fundamental. Uh, you listen to me? It's okay. Um, the idea was the curiosity, the interaction, and the playfulness. These are three elements that is very important for me. So every product that I design uh, give curiosity on the people, so the people they understand exactly uh, what they have in front of them. They can uh, try to. Uh, found their idea, they maybe must start to uh, create the idea. And then the interaction, they must touch, they must uh, play with the, the objects. And in that case, uh, they are more interesting to buy, to uh, have in the house, because uh, it's um, like come out again the, the, the younger people that are inside them. So, uh, uh, we start for this production. In this case, we use the Pyrex glass because uh, the bulbs is very hot. So inside we use the Pyrex glass because uh, with the Pyrex we don't have a problem. And, uh, uh, but we have the need to hide the, um, the structure of the bulbs uh, uh, solution. So we created a mesh in, uh, in aluminum and uh, stainless steel for cover hole. And uh, there is another problem. The hot inside the lamps. When we create the uh, structure very high, inside there is very hot. So there is the small hole you can see in the in that image. That hole, uh, the 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 hotter that are inside come out from the the line of the hotter or the the hole. In that case, uh, uh, we have the possibility to use for a long time with the with the bubble lamps. Now the project uh, is involved and uh, we use the LED light, so this problem is there, there isn't. But the first time I remember that it was a very long process. We spent around one year for uh, try the solution. We are done broken the glass and also we have the design that is very uh, attractive for the people. This uh, project is, uh, was selected for the design index. The design index in Italy is very famous. It's like the, this, uh, First step for take the um, Compasso d'Oro. Compasso d'Oro is the, for us, is like, uh, like the Oscar, no? Uh, so I show this, these lamps to the commission, they like, and uh, they select for the, for the next step. Then, uh, with the same company, I designed another lamp. So this lamp is very simple because uh, the brief was uh, only for the contract. We sell a lot of this because uh, it's very simple. It's only two kind of glass, one curved and another plain. Uh, 
um, it's only ideal for the wall lamps and for the ceiling because uh, in that moment we would just work a lot with the uh, contract area and the, lamp, the company asked me some media. So I try to uh, work on the research. I don't want the simple glass. I won't try to find the glass that is very uh, interesting about the shadow, about the lighting uh, sens sensitivity that we can have. So in that case, I use the curved lamps, curved glass, and uh, the plane for cover the lighting. Also in this case, the light that I use as a bulb lamps is very hot. And uh, so I need something that cover the lighting, and at the same time I need the, something that the light that come out is not natural, but is like the the shape is a more um, uh, more sen give more sensation around the ambience. And then there is the um, yeah the stool. Then the company decided to make the stool in poly polyethylene and uh, was a big success for uh, this kind of a solution. Also, they designed the, we designed the lamps because of the company design is a, lamp, is a lighting company. So uh, we created also the, the lamps with the same shape. And it was a big success. We, I remember that uh, for one order, we received uh, around 15,000 pieces of folio or one order. So it was a very uh, success. It was a very good idea for, um, uh, for the new kind of solution for uh, people. Now, uh, after 10 years, the Chinese started to copy, finally. And, uh, but it was, it was, for me, it was a big success because uh, they copy only after 10 years, no sun. So it was, uh, was very good. And now there's different kind of shape, similar like the cork stool. Uh, there's the evolution of the design. There's also the stone stool that is interesting more than this. Handle. This handle I designed uh, in 2003 and 2004, but the production starts after one year. And the first uh, uh, link is, um, is a very simple uh, design because I'm looking for something that I can use for different kind of doors, classical, modern. When I uh, go around with my clients and chose for uh, doors for um, uh, their apartment, I'm looking for some handle that is very uh, simple, good ergonomics, and uh, I can put in different solution. So there is a lot of good handle. The, the, maybe the good designer like uh, Mendini, like uh, uh, Mayer, uh, Ronard, and all design, but. Uh, uh, I'm looking for something that I can I can mix with the different uh, solution uh, for doors. So I talk with this company. The company is Mandelli. Mandelli is the third Italian company for uh, handles, and they uh, believe on the project and start with uh, this kind of a design. That uh, till now is now is uh, around uh, yeah 13 uh, years. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, they, they work and they sell too much. It's very interesting that um, after uh, uh, one year, the one year for set the, the handle on the, on the market, uh, we uh, started to sell around 5,000 pieces every three months. So it means that uh, it's around 1,000, 1,000 uh, people have in this apartment. And for me it was a big success because it means that uh, I, um, I uh, take my idea inside the apartment. The people that don't know me have something that is mine. So it means that they have uh, one product that uh, represents my idea, represents my concept. Me and these people that I don't know have the same idea, the same concept for uh, uh, through the, the, through my design. Like, uh, uh, say, Castiglioni. I like too much Castiglioni. Castiglioni, Achille Castiglioni is uh, one of the best Italian designers uh, on the world. And um, he said that uh, for us it's not important that I design something that is good for how I go. But it's important that we create the link between me and one person that I don't know. Because in that case, I transfer my idea to one people that uh, need something like uh, me, that's something that is like my, uh, my thinking. And with this design, and also with the other one, we have, uh, I think that I, uh, I received my success, and also my, uh, my goal, my idea. 
uh, Link is uh, on the market now about uh, 13 years. And uh, till now, uh, every three months, we sell around 2,000 pieces. So I think that is a good success, considering the timing. Because, uh, you know, the timing for the pro product, after 10 years, uh, 11 years, uh, they change. Don't more, uh, uh, we don't have more. Now, we, sometimes we prefer the presentation of the new solution. In this, uh, uh, in this Salone del Mobile in uh, Milano, uh, last month, uh, we presented the same uh, design, but uh, we changed the, um, the rose K and also the color. We have another two color, black color, black matte color, and uh, finish, and also the rose finish that uh, people like too much, and uh, we sell more about this. The second, second uh, handle is a um, handle more for office. Uh, the surface is, uh, is good, but it's different than Link, because uh, uh, in that case, I designed something that's more um, religious style. Uh, I aspire about uh, by house for this kind of, uh, of handle. The idea was uh, something that uh, uh, we can use, especially for the office area, for uh, some um, house that is very uh, huge, very elegant, when I can uh, fix it, something is very modern, very strong, this broken with uh, another kind, uh, the another kind of solution that are in the side apartment. Uh, this is uh, uh, the tiles that I designed only the, um, the product. The name is Tetris, but it's, uh, uh, it's easy to understand why. It's only the tiles, uh, simple tiles that uh, one company uh, show me. Say, I have this, but I don't know because I can't sell. I, do the, I designed the, the, um, the, the color, I chose the color. The production is very simple because it's concrete tiles. Uh, but I can sell, people don't want, so we can do it. I only remove one part, one quarter of the, the tiles and uh, change the color. So I play with the colors and also I found a different kind of shape, different kind of a solution. In that case, uh, uh, we started to sell, the company started to sell too much of, a, of this kind of a product. Uh, this is a, f a project about food design. Uh, in Italy, there is a big magazine, the name is Ottagono. Ottagono with uh, Interni and uh, Domus is the three big magazine, main magazine in, in Italy that talk about uh, design, interior, architecture, uh, graphics, everything is about around the, the creative world. And uh, they call me because they want to uh, realize the books with the idea about the designer, creative, uh, graphic designer, uh, architect, uh, that is different than that order. They give me the white paper. The idea is only to uh, design something that is, is a join with the food. So, um, uh, of course, like the other kind of a designer that, that work for this project, like uh, Rashid, like uh, Mendini, like uh, uh, Giovannoni, uh, I try to design something that I remember about my land. In my land is very famous. It is a sweet, is a um, uh, jelly. Uh, um, uh, the lemon is a uh, watermelon jelly. The watermelon jelly is uh, very famous in my land, like uh, sweet. So uh, I'm thinking to use the same concept, the same uh, material, but uh, change, uh, change the shape, all of this. And it uh, was a success because the people is very uh, happy to see. Uh, it's not only the graphic uh, uh, solution. I made this. In all my projects, after the design, the, the handle, I started to thinking that all my projects I wanted to realize. I wanted to put on the market, I wanted to um, create something. Every project that I do, I want to see on the market, absolutely. So I talk with my uh, friends that can do the, the suite. I found the mold in the Hong Kong market, and the mold is uh, like a diamond mold. So in that case, I put inside the, the, the liquid of the um, uh, watermelon, and then they danced the hole and they created the diamond like a rubin. In this case, it's a rubin. And the dimension is like a, is like a big diamond uh, because I found the mold that uh, the people use in the, in the market, in the USA market, for uh, ice. 
use the ice like a diamond for uh, the cocktail for uh, the scotch whisk and all. I changed the, the solution I used for uh, creating this, uh, this design. The, the idea was very good because uh, after this, uh, Ottagono called me every year for design the new concept of food design for uh, different kind of, uh, of books. Then we started for uh, design the appetizer, uh, then the pasta and the second and all, till uh, the fruit. So it was very interesting and uh, creative idea. This uh, uh, bookcase that I uh, presented last year in Salone del Mobile uh, is a competition that started uh, in 2015. Uh, this, the brief is very simple. Uh, design something that uh, uh, is made only in wood. We don't use a particle board, don't use a MDF, only wood. Uh, because uh, um, the manager of the company decided to um, give a possibility to, to the small handcraftsman that in that moment has a big problem with the crisis. So uh, in Italy there is a, a lot of companies that are just close and the, the, uh, the craftsmen need to um, find the different solution. So we join with, the, with them and create this kind of um, uh, bookcase. The particularity is that when the bookcase is closed, it's only 10 cm. The depth is only 10 cm, then uh, there is the, the shafts, that is a door. I push the door and go down. When go down, it uh, become like the shafts for uh, 35 cm. And uh, it's funny because uh, this, is, this picture is, uh, this picture is uh, no render. And uh, uh, when you open the single doors, you can decide which doors you can open. And uh, you can play every day for change the, the, uh, the design of your, uh, your bookcase. Was uh, hard to find the solution for the heavy, for the, for the weight. Every shelf can uh, uh, support around 10 kilos. So I can put also the TV, I can put inside the, some uh, vase and uh, everything I need for uh, for fix there, a lot of books, of course. This is my last project. Is um, we present next uh, next week when we be in Italy. Uh, this is the image of render that present in the catalog. Uh, this company called me uh, because they have one product. Is uh, the panel in HPL. HPL is uh, a new product that uh, is very resistant for outdoor. Maybe a lot of people you know because uh, in Italy we use too much for the playground. The playground for the kids in the park, they made it with the HPL. Uh, it's very scratch proof, waterproof, uh, hard, uh, hard materials, very strong for cut and also for, uh, for work. It's a different kind of a layer that you can uh, glue by special resin and then become only one block. And also we can change the final layer, different color, different finish. In that case, the company asked me, I have this product, but I don't know to present it to the people. So I started to design uh, this kind of idea, and uh, this kind of idea came from my experience in, uh, in India. I started to design this uh, just to play with the line. And with the line, I created a 3D impression in 2D solution. So in reality, the, the, the design is 2D, but the, the shape that came out is a 3D effect. And uh, uh, the HPL, the particularity is when, uh, when you broken, when you uh, cut the, the, the material, inside there is one part that the color is different. So I use the white and the cream color. And then, then when I design, when I create the, um, the line inside, the, the, the black color come out and they created the, the effect of like this that you can see here. In this moment we have uh, four uh, design and uh, we start the production uh, this, uh, this uh, month and uh, we present in the, uh, for the people I think uh, next, uh, next week. So this is a part of the, my work. Of course, we, there is a more, uh, more design. I chose this product because this product is just uh, in uh, production. This product that gives for me a lot of sources. Media, like you say, you is uh, to uh, stay in relation, stay 
created the interaction with the, the client, with the people that I don't know, because it's important that uh, we design something for uh, the people and design something that people can use. They can uh, need. Not the product are in just in production. I think that uh, it's difficult to, to invite the something because the, there is too much product on the market. But we can find some product that's more interesting for, uh, uh, for the people. The people need the product they can use, they can uh, play with them, they, can't, uh, they can uh, um, decide to have in this house because uh, it's something that they missed in now. See, this is my product. I hope that you like I hope that you, um, so you, you, you like the, the product that I designed. And uh, okay, I told now we talk with you. Okay, thank you, you Pierre Francesco. Uh, I'd now like to invite Rushad to come up and present. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I said, and the whole team. So, uh, though I'm trained as an architect, um, I have my own architectural and interior practice uh, based in Mumbai since the last five years. Uh, a large section of the office looks at uh, furniture design as well as material development as the uh, core research uh, base for the practice. And uh, what I've done today in the presentation is broken it up into five different sections uh, to kind of showcase how, in a way, uh, the methodology of the office uh, is the thinking, the, uh, the process of making, and also the thought process that goes behind uh, the furniture and then how it kind of influences some of the interior projects that we've been doing. So uh, this is uh, one of the first uh, pieces uh, that I made when I moved back to India around five years ago. Uh, and more than the piece, it was really the uh, technique of making. Uh, here there was the research working with uh, local craftsmen uh, of carpenters and also uh, looking at embroidery as uh, something which would not be only uh, done onto fabrics, but where I could incorporate embroidery in, uh, in this particular case, it's on wood. Uh, which uh, the idea was also that the upholstery could be woven into the structure of the furniture piece. And uh, though it seems fairly simple, it took a number of uh, months or close to a year of R&D to kind of figure out how we can put together uh, both of these quite unseemingly opposite uh, craftsmen in a way of carpenters and uh, embroiders and make them work together to uh, create um, almost a different kind of a tapestry effect. And uh, so from that, uh, about a year later, it was incorporated in the Christian Louboutin boutique in Bombay. Uh, and in this case, it was uh, used as a wall cladding. Uh, and the reason why I want to um, show both these cases is also that in the beginning, it was uh, just an idea of technique. Uh, it was about uh, creating a material uh, process of making and which was applied onto furniture and became much more of a research tool. Uh, and then how could that uh, be used in different kinds of uh, applications? Uh, and here it was uh, made into these uh, concave convex tiles, uh, which were individually embroidered uh, and then fixed onto the wall. Uh, it also has a different acoustical properties, which was unintentional, but which we came to realize once uh, it was done because of the holes and the uh, fabric with uh, the threads within that. The second uh, is a material exploration. Uh, in this case, it was really about uh, testing uh, casting of resin and how could we control uh, the casting process. Uh, this was a chair done for the Godrej Design Lab, and uh, I called it uh, Frozen Motion. And it was really to understand how we could inject uh, an ink or a dye into uh, the resin uh, when the resin is almost set. 
Uh, so it was really more technically challenging in terms of introducing a second liquid in uh, just before it sets so that you kind of freeze uh, the dissolving process. Um, and uh, similarly, it was then used uh, within an architectural, like an uh, interior uh, facade, where this is a cafe done in uh, Bandra La Foley Lab. And uh, not getting into the entire project, but uh, the idea was to also uh, showcase the different kind of ingredients or the uh, ingredients that were used in the pastries. So in this case, each of the different elements were cast into resin and then used as a uh, facade, uh, like a glazing system. The third is uh, the use of craftsmanship. This uh, I am particularly interested in using different local uh, crafts in different parts of uh, India. And uh, this was an exploration done using uh, marble carving in Jaipur, uh, where they are incredibly gifted and make different deities of gods, goddesses. Uh, but the idea here was to create something which is uh, conceptually quite fragile like the light bulb and uh, carve it uh, to almost a 6 mm thinness uh, so that it could then uh, work as uh, a light bulb. And then there were different kind of carving patterns which were added on uh, just as a level of ornamentation and also to push the limits of uh, the craft. Uh, this luckily was then incorporated on uh, a wall, a compound wall at Alt Mount Road. Uh, and this is just a section of the uh, 200 foot long wall which had different elements to it. Uh, but here it was almost marking the threshold as a, a compound wall for Lodha. And each of them had different carvings and uh, different sizes which kind of had a reference to their marketing in terms of the number of floors, apartment sizes, etc. Um, the fourth uh, direction uh, which I wanted to present is the use of also technology uh, within the practice. Uh, we also sometimes uh, develop scripts on uh, Rhino, which is a software that we use, uh, to kind of create uh, like a pattern generating uh, system. Uh, in this particular case, I had uh, designed a series of seven carpets uh, for cocoon rugs. And uh, one side of it was it was handmade, etc. But uh, what was more interesting in this case was the use of the script to generate patterns. And it was taking two traditional flooring patterns and kind of uh, morphing them into one another. Uh, almost similar to Escher's Desolations, uh, which create a new system of uh, pattern making, uh, which almost has a hybrid between the two. Uh, this was... Also, we also do uh, visual merchandising. I designed the windows for uh, Hermes in India. And uh, this was the very first window I did four years ago uh, for them. And uh, it was using the similar idea where we took very traditional, uh, typical motifs of uh, the brand and morphed them with one another. So uh, it's a bit small to see from here, but uh, they basically created a complete field of uh, new ways in which uh, those symbols and motifs could be then incorporated uh, within the brand. And then each of those were uh, cut out of stainless steel uh, and fixed onto uh, the back panels to create a, a hybrid or a field of uh, tessellated patterns of uh, the brand. And uh, the last uh, direction that I wanted to show is also uh, the way in terms of a uh, conceptual rigor uh, in this particular project. It was a uh, small patisserie in uh, Juhu and the client was very keen on making a space which was completely pink and uh, also referencing La Dure, a more French patisserie. And uh, so uh, the idea behind what we introduced within the space was also to work with uh, anamorphic projections. So as an idea, uh, we, uh, because this was going to be uh, different patisseries throughout the city and then uh, in India, and instead of creating the same look throughout, the idea was to use uh, a strong visual motive, which is uh, part of the brand in this particular case, uh, the bicycle. And uh, it was 
uh, set in such a way because if you actually see the site, it's a long linear uh, site. So from the outside, uh, when you're standing straight onto the store, you see uh, the bicycle in its perfect uh, perspective. And then as you move through the space, the perspective breaks and has uh, a pink splash uh, within. And what seemed as a very simple idea, uh, technically it became almost a nightmare. It was a logistical nightmare to get the tiles uh, matching with the mirror because all of them were done at factories at different sources. And uh, it was really like a moment of truth when it was all put together at the store and luckily uh, the bicycle came in place. So uh, that's it. I'd now like to invite Shonan up to present. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shonan and uh, I'm the principal architect at uh, LAB, which is Language Architecture Body. Uh, our office has just walked in, so they're all here too. <laughs> um, the premise of calling it, starting with it being named Language Architecture Body was the idea that we would work between narrative, the built environment and the habitation of, the, of it. And the built environment really being the link between this narrative and the habitation and that's it. So when we first started, uh, we were going to build a brick building and someone in the office said, which brick should we use? And um, we looked at the bricks around and there was wire cut and there was engineered bricks and handmade bricks. And we said, you know we, what, we must explore this idea of the brick and we must look at it and we centered a workshop around it where we developed um, eight different modules, some stacked well, some curved well. Um, but we were quite attracted to this one brick which was the V-brick because we felt instinctually that it would have these properties that we could use. We modeled it in foam, in clay, cardboard, molds and then we worked with brick makers to make molds and make um, the system and make the system work. Um, and we, we, we actually, just, it had a performance value of interlocking uh, and it became a self-structuring system where we could actually assemble the bricks without any cement mortar, which acts as the glue. And so we could essentially use it as a self-structuring system only as bricks. Five years later, we are finally building a brick building. Uh, we called it the Brick Beast because it's kind of ugly. But um, it is, it's got this, we wanted the, the envelope of the building, the brick building to be, do more than just keep things out and bring things in or keep things in. So we said, you know, the envelope really, this is that, that skin between the outside world and, and, and the inside. So we wanted to collect water, let the wind grow, let it do things and, and also tell the time. So when you're driving by, it's got a sundial on it so that, you know, people who are fubbing in their car can look up and remember that there are other ways to tell time. Um, and so we are now developing this. This is really a work in progress and it's just starting. Um, you know, there's this funny thing when you're an architect, when you go and ask to build a building, they want you to have built a building before that. And that's kind of hard. <laughs> so how do you get around that? So you, we had to build maybe 40 interiors, homes, before we were, people saw a spark of innovation and, that, and, and, and the creative innovation to say that, oh, maybe let's take a chance and let them build a building. Although that's what we had been trained to do for many, many um, years. So after someone takes a chance on you. We were given a very, it, it was a, our first architectural project um, out of our office in Bombay, which is about six and a half years old. Um, and it's a, it's a, it was with a wonderful client in Goa. It was a very narrow site, very steep in both directions. So it was about 15 meters wide, but hundreds of meters long, kind of like a railroad, and extremely steep in both directions. So we wanted to do a gentle architectural intervention that would still be able to give the kind of space that the client required, but at the same time work as a, as, a, as a house that gradually reveals itself. So we built a structure that bridges the topography. You arrive on a much lower level in the second picture, you can sort of see it's really dark. Um, and you sort of see a small house that behind which there's a courtyard which is revealed and that bridges over to a first floor level that that aligns itself with the higher level of the land. So creating this first floor level that has all the social gathering spaces and the pool, as well as one bedroom, and then the other bedrooms are tucked below and above. 
So this was a very gentle sort of intervention. Uh, it was a, in terms of the way it was, you know, you also have to then prove you know how to build buildings <laughs> once you build them and um, go down that, that path. Um, we, there was a nice mix of traditional elements as well as um, modern elements. We used rather industrial critical um, glass and metal windows with traditional Mangalorean tile roofs. So there was this combination of, of things. And then we were quite lucky that for our second building that we got to build was um, an office building in Ahmedabad. And uh, the client came to us with a set of plans saying that this is the building, now can you build it? And it was a box. And we said, well, this is quite strange, but you know, we're getting to build a building, so we'll do it. Um, so I, our first intuition was to, to, to bring light into the center of this box. So to bring light into the center of this box, we created these slots that would, that would slice into the box, doing these operations on the box. A client being you know, a good businessman who said, you know, you've cut these uh, slots into my box and you've got light in, but now what about all the area that you've eaten up? So we had to build another floor on top, which had a lot of height restrictions, which meant that we had to do a flat slab construction, which meant that the interiors had to be integrated with the architecture and that all, all this came together. And then the, the sort of intuition of just bringing light into the center of the box, it became a sustainability project where it all became directed by the sun, shading from the sun, using the sun. We developed a second skin for the southern facade. Um, and on the east and west, we had deep slots which bounced the light on opaque walls into the center of the, of the, of the box. Uh, then we, in, we did a lot of interior projects, which I'm not going to show you. But we've been very fortunate to get into retail in the last uh, couple of, in the last year or so. And we've got two very special uh, projects that we've been working on. One, and what was really interesting about retail is that we, I mean, is that you, the, everyone is trying to connect with their consumer in many ways. And everyone's trying to build this relationship, which goes back to sort of like this social analysis and anthropology of what's, um, and the psychology of a consumer. And we knew nothing about retail. We were totally ignorant. So we had to invent everything. And that I think was quite an advantage because we didn't know anything about display systems and we didn't know anything about, so we went, and the brief that was given was very simple for the Global Desi rebranding was that one should, they want to emphasize a very young, vibrant um, feel, but also it should have this India modern story. So we developed each element and each display element, uh, which we later found out were usually just like metal arms in, in, the, in the store. Um, and and then and we use traditional Indian flooring, but done in a, 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 a patterns that are sort of morphed uh, with jaisalmer, white stone. We interpreted many Indian elements like the jula to a to a contemporary swing. There was also this idea of sound, right? Like all, a lot of stores have music playing through, but we thought, what are the other sounds in India? And the brass bell resonated. We thought, you know, there should be the sound of a ghanta. So we outside the trial rooms, we put a bell with a dory inside that one could pull so that you could call for help. And you have these clang, 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 clang happening in a retail store, which can be quite funny sometimes, because you don't expect it. And the other retail store that we've been working on that we are very excited about um, is Nicoba. And we did the first project for them. And you know, this was, it's, it was amazing, an amazing process because the clients were, had, they gave us the initial brief that they want a store that people want to spend a couple of hours in. So this meant that it had to be more than just selling product. And it was a really interesting process working with our clients who are here today also. And um, we had to think about this cultural extension of the brand and the second layer to over the space. So there were other elements besides the display of, of, their, of their product which um, were to connect the, their consumers and, the, and their customers as, they, uh, as uh, to become part of their community. So we would have steps that open it up to become seats for a film screening. We would have a collaborator's table for workshops to happen, a letter writing desk for people to write letters from and post in a post box. Um, we did a uh, take on the, if you can see in the right corner, on the Indian post box in a uh, with just steel and, and wood. Um, and, and place, and place where the people feel very comfortable. So like a swing where you can display cushions, but you can also use it for a book reading. So there was this sort of second layer and this extension of the culture over there. Um, we all, then after that, we, we've also worked on num a number of um, interior projects that are for, for homes, none of which I'm going to show you, but 
the, this is very interesting from a programmatic point of view because it was a collaborative workspace. Uh, this is Ministry of New here in, in Bombay. And it was a very unique space because it was in a heritage building filled with beautiful lights. So the intervention was mostly at a furniture level and at a, um, at a just bringing in various f flexibilities to the space, workspaces that are also collaborative, but also where you can have the privacy and, and work individually in focus, flexible spaces where you could have events. Um, and the one thing that we consistently like to do between both our interior projects and our architectural projects is to sort of embed the idea of art being in architecture and not letting these two things be divided or creating space for then art to arrive. Um, and we will also feel that it brings a certain joy to the space. So we, we experimented a lot with uh, con etching in concrete to create shadows that, uh, that, that show an image in a certain light. We also, like, we got a mandate for that we were doing an office which said, oh, our office always has to have a world map. So we turned it into a 55-meter-long brass and metal sculpture of the world map across the entire wall. Uh, we experimented putting organic material with concrete, bamboo rings. We then eventually used bamboo strands. Um, and then we uh, show you one of our commercial projects just because to see how it resonates later in architectural <laughs> projects. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we get these global mandates, which ha a lot of things are fixed in them. It's the type of table we work with, it's the type of chair we work with, and it works really well. So where do we find our space in those? So we have to find ways of... So we identified all the functional objects which could become... which are both um, the furniture and the space as well as the... can be designed to, to, uh, to add value to the space in other ways. Um, so if you look at the reception desk, which was made out of brass and metal, then the huddle spaces, which had tessellated forms with fabric on the inside for acoustics, and then there's like a screen wall in the cafeteria, which had a line drawing on it, which as you move it changes. So there's the kinetic, sort of like a movement element to it. And one of the innovations in this was that the, uh, the duct system that we used, and Rumi is here, of course, who work very closely on this, uh, where the duct system, the fabric duct system that is actually for, for, is for delivering cooled air, um, it was actually used in pharmaceutical uh, labs. And it's a clean duct delivery system in which you could literally unzip the, it's fabric ducts, you can unzip it, wash it and put it back. And it's actually a really efficient way of delivering um, cooled air to the space and very clean. But when we had to, of course, convince our clients, uh, there was no office of sorts which had ever done this uh, on this scale. So this was like one lakh square feet of, of fabric ducts. So we had to, of course, um, part of doing innovation is convincing your clients also to, to agree to do it. Uh, this is a house we're building uh, on a hillside um, near a lake. And there's certain elements that we did in our interior projects which now are finding themselves into the architectural projects where we are casting words into the slabs. So, you know, when you're, so that there's a certain element of, you know, bringing in what would be done in normally like interior finishes really into the base architectural elements. Um, and then the, the, the other projects which we have, which have really in terms of program been a great outlet for innovation have, have been schools and healthcare. And in schools, what was really interesting, this was the client who was in uh, building schools in rural Maharashtra, really drought ridden areas. And they, they're CBSE schools, but they really want to, to, to encourage child led learning. They really want to, they're very progressive about their learning systems. So we proposed uh, a subject room model, which each room is a subject. It requires a lot of movement through the entire building. So we made the entire building, the, all the students move through the building like a continuous Mobius loop. So it's all unidirectional. This allowed us to have a, a efficiency on our corridors, as well as reduce the number of classrooms that are required. So we actually were able to achieve a floor pit efficiency of building 15% less. So of course, this is always ways to which you know, clients, of course, are also, also interested in. And, we, and with this whole system, you're able to create every learning environment to be very specific. Because if a language room is there, then that room itself has the infrastructure to be a language room. If it's a math room, so and so. So it's not just that any classroom is void of all of the... So we would use the window systems, the wall systems, and all to be part of the learning environment and can be um, done that way. The uh, other project that this is a hospital, Medanta Hospital in Lucknow. We were actually uh, engaged to do the medical planning in the interiors, but we saw the facade and we thought that there's, a, there's an opportunity here for us to do something. And we, there was a lot of glass, and we thought, you know, we should shelter this glass because there was a west facing element to it. 
And you know, the rivers and flowing water are very important in Lucknow. So we thought we'd install a fin system for the shading, but it will follow these curves that are inspired by the, um, by the flow of water and by rivers. And then the other thing we wanted to do was we wanted to connect with the people who pass by this building every day. Um, so there's a large highway which goes across the, in front of this building and uh, we arranged the fins in such a way that for a fleeting second you can read uh, a calligraphy that is uh, written on the fins and then that disappears as you move along and in one way it's written in Hindi and on the, when you're returning the other way it's written in Urdu. And that of course worked well because left to right, right to left, so <laughs> that, was, that worked out from the road point of view. Um, and, and then, you know, when you have a front on view, you just see the, you, you lose the, the calligraphy itself. It's dedicated to life. Um, the other inspiration was looking at, at, at other local tr traditional architecture elements. So we were looking at the arrival area and the thought was that, you know, a colonnade of arches is a sheltering element. And therefore, the canopy being a sheltering element, we must look at, we can, let's reinterpret the arch. So, Soman, who's here, reworked the arch to, um, to design a canopy that would be the arrival canopy. But, it's, but it, from multiple angles, you sort of see the arch, then you lose it, and then it arrives again visually, mm, and in a much more dynamic format than our traditional arches. That inspiration of water as well as arches continues into the interior spaces, and it has performative values also. In the public lobbies, we have these undulating ceilings that are like rivers, but they also have great acoustic properties. Um, and the re reinterpretation of the arch also in the public spaces um, of, of the hospital. This is, of course, in Gurgaon over here. The, um, uh, this, of course, the lead architect was Arcop, and we w I was working on it, and then we continue to still work on it. Um, the design of the facade was very interesting. So typically the, the hospital, the arrangement of this hospital is very interesting because it's what, what you would have built over a very large campus, like an Ames campus, in one building. So it's got an incredible amount of efficiency in the, in the way that <laughs> medical care can be delivered. So it, each floor is a different institute, like neurology, cardiac, orthopedics, but then they're vertically connected. So the idea was that one could deliver integrated health care for multiple disease patients. Um, and the, the, one of the thoughts while designing the facade and, and the building massing was that one of the most important things is sunlight in a hospital. And usually people build hospitals in cubes because it's the most efficient and the most expensive part of the building is the envelope and you want to reduce your perimeter to reduce that. But we well, we realized when we were building such a large building that the wait for patients to queue themselves into the day cycle, sunlight is a very important part. Also reorienting yourself in such a large building is, is really important. So we actually increased the perimeter of the building massively, so that uh, although increasing the cost of the construction, but allowing natural light to come to every res resident patient area. Um, and the other thing was that typically, like hotels, you have very repetitive windows that happen, that uh, are along the patient rooms. And that sort of gives this sort of mass uh, repetitive window uh, series. We wanted to humanize that scale, also make it more specific. So we took three window sizes and rearranged them in different permutations and combinations so that every room has a different light quality as well. So even as a medical caregiver, when you enter the room, it's slightly different because of the light in it. And um, also to blur this, the facade and make it uh, emphasize that each part of the, each, each element is, is, is unique and not just a repetition of, of, of rooms. And the other element that has been very interesting in the space is there's a healing tree, which is like the tree of life that is in many cultures, in the middle of the hospital. It's a very modern technical building, but in the center of the, there is this tree of life which is carved out of Dholpur. And without any instruction or plaques or, or explanation, people instinctively go and tie a thread and, and, and say, and, and, and are either contemplative or meditative or say a prayer. And it, it was an amazing social phenomenon because no one asked them to do that. No one, it was just lying there and people did it. And then it, it sort of, and this is, you know, where craft becomes very functional in a space and has a social, so social meaning. So that's well, some of our, thank you.
Thank you, Shonan. Uh, before we invite Rajiv up, sorry, he's our last presenter and also our moderator for the discussion after. We have a lot of men, many new additions and uh, we'd like to close lunch soon. So if you haven't grabbed lunch, we invite you to do so now. You can grab a plate and come and sit and listen. So please do that. Rajiv, you're up. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Avid and Assad and the whole team for inviting me here today to speak and to anchor the session on um, designing tomorrow. Um, I'm an architect uh, by training, but I'm also, um, before I went into architecture, I was an artist, uh, art major at least, and I think I'll always be an artist, but uh, professionally I turned to architecture and, and design, um, and I've been practicing since 1994. Um, I grew up, in, grew up in New York and I worked for a lot of uh, international practices like SOM and uh, advertising agencies in New York doing various things. So um, coming, to, coming to India about 16, 17 years ago and actually uh, trying to set up a practice uh, has been an interesting, interesting shift and change. Um, it, Part of, my, part of my practice has always been um, about architecture, art, education, also academics. So the name of my firm is Art, and it kind of works well as an architect, or whether I want to be an artist, or whether I want to be an academic, and I kind of keep it very, very vague that way, and I make it so, um, because I do believe that, um, uh, as have we seen also in the previous presentations, that uh, Practice is not just one thing. Design is not just one thing. It's a kind of multifarious uh, process. It involves lots of different disciplines, lots of different ideas. And um, what I'm going to present today, and I, I thought I would, I would, I think looking at everyone's presentations as well, is try to make it um, clear that I don't design in any one specific way, or I des don't design at any one specific scale, and I don't deny myself the opportunity to design um, or to enter into different processes, regardless of what my education or my background is. So, um, okay, so I'll start from the larger scale. Of course, like I said, I grew up in New York. I worked for SOM right out of, uh, right out of university. And that was interesting because those were the biggest projects I've ever worked on in my entire life. I worked on JFK, uh, International Terminal. I worked on... Um, at least four or five skyscrapers internationally and in New York, uh, worked on huge developments in China. And I think um, somehow in the last 20 something years, my work just keeps on getting smaller and smaller, which is very strange because normally people start off with very small projects and then they move to kind of bigger ideas and they have the challenge of, of um, trying to translate those processes that they've kind of encouraged and developed over those years and make them into big works um, and try to understand that complexity, the change in complexity. Uh, mine seems to be getting more clear the smaller, the smaller I, I, I move into work. So this is a kind of middle scale project. Uh, this is something I did about six, seven years ago. It's an office building in Bangalore. Uh, and the developer was very clear that he wanted a commercial office building. And so for me, um, you know, frankly speaking, I, I was not so interested in doing that and I wanted to propose something different. So instead of a, a ca does this have a laser pointer? Does this have a laser? No, no. Um, if you see the plan down below, uh, normally what office buildings have is an atrium. And it's enclosed and it's usually several stories and it's air conditioned. And I said Bangalore is a beautiful weather. Um, there's absolutely no reason for you guys to have an atrium. It's gonna be ex extra cost. Why don't we just do an outdoor uh, atrium that's covered so it protects it from the rain? But uh, the staff and the people in the building and people who are visiting would enter through this lovely outdoor atrium. So what we did was we designed a basic, um, if you see the plan on the, on the bottom, the corner of the building we carved out and we made it a kind of outdoor sitting area. It's huge, it's, it's quite big. It's about, if you see, it's about one sixth of the floor plate and it rises uh, five floors. Um, but the problem with this was uh, to also enclose it from the elements, but also allow uh, wind and other things to kind of pass through it. So we developed a, um, we, sorry, we developed a perforated skin and structure. Um, so we developed a perforated skin and structure, which is actually quite nice because in the daytime, uh, as you see in the picture from on the left, 
uh, the light passes through the atrium and you kind of see the underlying structure of the building. Also, wind passes very easily through. So people who are sitting inside in the shade also get wind into the atrium. And it's just done with trees and planting and there's actually no AC cost. And this has worked out pretty well. I think Mercedes-Benz actually took this building uh, right after it was built and they've been there for about six, seven years now. Um, uh, the next project was um, a villa layout again in Bangalore, and uh, th there are two there are two issues of innovation here. Again, villas and uh, architectural design. I don't want to necessarily talk about the specifics of that, but what we wanted to do was kind of just change the perception of what, for example, um, a private complex would would be, how it could be designed. Um, you know, even for a kind of a residential community or a gated community. So, if you see the image to the top right, that is the a clubhouse, uh, so that's when you kind of enter. And the idea behind design there was very simple, is not to make it look like a clubhouse. To make it look like it was a series of forms or elements within the landscape. And um, the large volume you see at the top, which is that white volume, that's actually like the squash court or the interior court, which, which allowed us to play with the heights of the volumes. And the back is the swimming pool and all. Second is the layout of the, of the villas. Um, typically, uh, because of zoning regulations and all, we, we, we center a villa in, in a plot. Even if we divide a large area, we make a plot and we center a villa in the plot, and then we put boundary walls and gates on each side. Uh, wh the problem with that, it was very simple here, is that um, you end up with three or four, five feet space on each side of the villa, which is totally useless. Uh, it becomes a walkway to the back. or and it, uh, So what we did was, we, uh, you know, I, I suggested, why don't you just move the villa to the boundary wall to plot on the side and give them 10, 12 feet of playground on, the, on, on one side that was adjacent to the next villa. So actually the amount of open space for each villa became much larger and we designed the interior of the villa so that none of the private spaces from the adjacent villa were looking into that garden. So we kind of were able to look at um, a way of uh, program, uh, also giving the people back a kind of a social space within a very, uh, you know, uh, I think contested prog uh, program typology nowadays is the idea of gated communities and that's a big question um, uh, for a lot of people. So how to give people back their private space uh, and make a public space for them as well. This was a project, um, this was never built, but this was interesting because this happened about three, four years ago when the um, Royal Western Turf Club, uh, the lease on the land had expired and there was a huge controversy about whether this land should go back to the city. And um, so they approached me um, uh, through one of the members saying that we would like to see if we could design public spaces within our uh, landscaped areas that we're not using for the, for the club. So they gave me two acres, a two acre site, um, which is uh, adjacent to the parking lot when you enter the Royal Western Turf Club on the way to Gallops. There's a water tank that uh, supplies all the water to the, to the turf club. And they gave me a two acre site there, which is absolutely beautiful because it just had an old tool shed on it, which they used to kind of service equipment. Um, some horse, horse circles, which they used to walk the horses and lots of trees. Um, and the design approach here was really simple for me. First, don't cut any trees. That was the first thing. I'm not cutting one tree. Um, renovate the existing tool shed. Use the same exact footprint, but create um, a rainwater harvesting also structure there so that it could store more water. So the building on the right, if you see that white um, slab that goes across, that's like a swimming pool uh, structure on top of the, so that which collects water and also stores it as a tank. Um, and uh, there's a, so this long thing is the tool shed, the circle is the water tank. And I, I just basically introduced a program of a petting zoo, a petting zoo, an organic uh, market and farm. And uh, I kept the horse circles where they are because that was really interesting. I thought people could come there and actually uh, ride the horses. And a small fish pond and, uh, and, and other things for, for them, an aviary as well. Um, and I just introduced these programs kind of spaced out within the landscape of the, of the thing. They liked the program, but of course, you know, as politics are there, every year they change the managing committee. There's always an election and the next person did not want to do it. So the, I, I suggested to them that they should be in power for three years, you know, because that would be at least the amount of time that you would need to construct a project or take a project forward and they have not gotten back to me. Um, 
smaller in scale, going smaller in scale. This was a renovation that we did for um, a young 23-year-old uh, tech um, kind of, he was doing some kind of technology, um, you know, programming software and things like that. And uh, he had a small space, about 1,200 square feet. These are the images of the existing space when I first went to site on the lower left. Um, the building is a G plus two structure. It's totally, literally, I, I was holding my notepad on top of my head because the bottom of the slab was was like, cra you know, falling, and um, you know, every time we touched the wall, something would fall. So I said that first, you have to do every, you have to redo everything in terms of the structure. But I just wanted to look at the idea of when you talk about innovation. Innovation is also not. They were a technology company but we weren't experts in technology and we weren't going to add value in terms of their software or how he designed software. So what we did was we just took schematics of his thoughts and his ideas on how he wanted to organize the space and we used architectural elements to kind of start to diagram that out. So if you see like for example the wiring and the conduits of the, of the lighting are all exposed wires. They're not even conduits, they're wires that just kind of travel around the space. Uh, they can just be unhooked and dragged out at any time. Um, the walls are just painted white, the flooring is epoxy, there's nothing much to it. Uh, the technology, whatever we kind of looked at, was basically providing him with a basic infrastructure for him to add kind of value into, into the space afterwards. And there was a lot of structural work, so we used a lot of those elements, like these yellow beams that you see are all steel bracketing um, that was done to basically support the terrace from falling into his office. Um, so all that was done. Um, interesting project because he, he actually ended up not starting his startup and his parents took the space for their, for their office. And then he said that um, I ran into him very strangely enough. He heard my voice while I was in the bathroom at the Kochi Biennale. And he started saying, Rajiv, Rajiv. And I said, yes. And then I walked outside and you know, I, I have this problem now. If I see someone in one context and I meet them somewhere else, I can't remember who they are. So I looked at him in the bathroom and I said, yes. And he said, I love that space. And I said, thank you, which space? And he said, I said, oh, oh, oh sorry, 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 sorry. And so he said he spent three days there in a workshop with his friends because his parents lent it to him. And he said that it was just a, such a nice change. And he never expected in the beginning. I wanted something really simple. They didn't want to spend any money. It was ridiculous. I said, listen, you have to do it. If you want something interesting, you have to spend the time, you have to spend the money, and you have to have faith in the designer or in the architect. Um, going from commercial space to residential space, again, very small, same, same footprint, 1,200 uh, square feet very small and the only requirement for them was I want clean, I want non-maintenance, and I want lots of storage. That's what I want. There was no other brief. I don't like this color, I don't like this, they didn't interfere. They said, you just give me that. And so what I did was give them that, but try to make the space really light, um, very airy, uh, use very simple materials, and at a cost which I personally believe was achievement for me because it came under 30 lakhs for 1,200 square feet, which is, frank, I mean, they, of course, they helped a lot with finding materials and getting costs down and things, but um, just to see that design is not necessarily expensive also. It's just a kind of a mentality and it's a series on how you approach um, a project. Even smaller in scale, uh, this was a, a first design we did for Royce Chocolates. Uh, they eventually built a store, the first store, with, and we did that with Shonen um, uh, as associate architects uh, in Palladium and the annex back to the, uh, uh, ho the hotel entrance next to Gucci. But this was the first design they did where they wanted a kind of a kiosk. So the idea was, okay, they wanted to sound, they're totally business type people, they don't understand space. Uh, they don't understand material, this, that, but they said that, you know, this brand is really important to us. It's Japan. It's the first time they're coming into India. So we want something that talks about the culture, and we also want something that, for us, is very personal to us, that, that we could say that this is developed in India. So I did use, of course, a lot of... Um, references of Japanese culture like the sushi, the Godzilla, and, and the picture on the left. Any of you, I'm sure most of you have had or some of you have had Royce chocolates, that's their famous Nama uh, grid 
uh, on the left. And I used that to do, kind of develop this kiosk, which kind of had this very light, airy quality, and also lo talked a lot about design as a user experience. So normally when you go to a kiosk, you kind of walk to a counter, and you know you're, you're outside of this space, and you're, you know you feel like you're kind of in the bustle of everything. Here you had to kind of slide in behind this uh, screen wall, which was influenced by the idea of bamboo. And uh, you stand inside a kind of space, and you have an experience of tasting, then buying, looking, and all that. Um, and this would be, for example, was set in the atrium of the of Palladium, of the of the main uh, shopping area. This wasn't built; they got the space, and they built the the, the store. Even smaller scale, this was an installation we did with Cry India, um, looking at child's rights. And uh, again, this, uh, you know, inspiration comes from many different, um, I think, you know, areas in life. And my social life and my personal life is a huge inspiration for me. My kids, uh, my wife, what she does, she's a filmmaker, so with things that she does somehow influence me. Uh, so this is my son on the lower left, and he loves to play with Lego. And so I'd always make these things with Lego with him, and they're all over the place in the house. So we were doing this installation, I said, why don't we just scale it up, and uh, so we built these kind of boxes. Can you just play that video on the, on the lower right? And in the long box, the metal box that's um, there, this is like a kaleidoscope. It's, it's clad in mirrors. And what we did was we made a series of films um, not about child's rights specifically, but what we did was we thought about what children like. And then we had that basically um, adults imitate what children do, for example. So there was an adult looking at um, buying cotton candy. There were, um, my cousins were all eating ice cream and smashing it all over their face. There were fireworks. There were, um, uh, this, the video in the lower right was basically airplanes, paragliders, birds, all merged into a video and then put into a kaleidoscope so that, you know, people, kids were fascinated. They would just sit there all day and they would look, as you see in the video, they would love to watch these films. Um, and so the idea was to not say that, you know, make it very point pointy and luxury that this is a child's rights has to be about this, but to understand that if, if adults can also act like children and like to act like children, then you should also let children be children uh, in that way. And this was pretty successful. We did this on Carter Road uh, for about a week um, in Bandra. Even smaller scale, we just did two. Pro I just did two projects at uh, the Kochi uh, Museums Biennale. One was a public project, which was more infrastructure for the for the Biennale, which was this. It was called Happy Medium, and uh, it was designed as an interface of public spaces. What we said was they didn't want any heavy infrastructure. They wanted something light and you know that could be moved around and also unique. Uh, so what we did was we just went to the local markets in Mutton Chair and we picked up lots of old doors, junk, things that the people were selling, but they were in bad condition. Uh, and we used them as, can you play this video on the left? We used them and we kind of changed the way people perceive them. So we used it as furniture or ways to kind of climb compound walls or look at the sea or the ocean. Uh, these girls, we got this video, luckily, of them actually, you know, using the slide uh, we made out of this one door. So again, it's about perception and just kind of making people um, look at something in slightly different way. And that, I think, is one way of innovating um, in terms of design. This was the project that, and, and like I said, architecture, art, uh, academics, they all, for me, they all kind of, in terms of design, they all mix together. So uh, while I was uh, doing that project with them on a, on a kind of a collaborative or collateral scale, I had also applied, I had an idea for an art project, and I applied it and I sent it to Sudarshan. And he said, come and meet me. And uh, the fantastic thing about being an architect is that I was able to build models you know, of what I wanted to do. I was able to quickly visualize it spatially and actually build models. And he, the first thing he looked at me as I brought these plastic bags I was walking with him, and he said, what did you do? I pulled it out, and he was like, oh, you brought models. And he was like, show me, show me, show me. So we sat there for about half an hour, and he was just like sliding them in and out. And what's interesting about this is each of these boxes is on a dovetail uh, system. So it's not one huge thing that has to be packed in that way. It's actually all individual units that just slide uh, together. And as you keep on packing the units together, they stay. 
They stay in place. Um, uh, and it was quite nice to work on. The, that, that is one aspect of it in terms of the innovation of the technology. The other one was as an architect, I realized nobody other than architects goes to architecture exhibitions or, you know, I mean, we talk to ourselves in some way and we all believe in what we're doing. But um, to get other people to understand what you're doing is very difficult. So we were doing some research on housing, affordable housing and, and, and slums and SRA as part of Studio X, which was something I was curating for the last five, six years. We were doing this thing and I was like saying, nobody's gonna come to this exhibition, so I'm not gonna do an exhibition, let's not do it. But I took all that data and I started to make drawings as an artist, as a, a drawings of homes from all different types of cultures and histories. And so all of these boxes are basically, if you see on the lower right, these are four of them, but these are conceptual ideas of people's homes from all over the world. They could be tents, they could be houseboats, they could be slums, um, there are houses in the middle of Germany in a forest, there are townhouses in New York, skyscrapers. And the idea was to assemble all of those in a visual, spatial piece that would make people understand that, um, you know, we're not so different, we all have a kind of common need to, for shelter and housing, and how we could actually look at them as, not as an architect saying we need low-income housing, but as an as an artist saying that this is important to look at all of this in like some kind of holistic um, way. And I think that's really interesting for designers also to kind of try to um, move between disciplines and also engage people in that, um, in that very different way. And the last thing is very, very small pieces that I did about six, seven years ago, but this again, very influenced by architecture, but this was purely art. I mean, in the sense that for me, it was about putting it in a gallery and getting people's inputs and wa people's walking by as if they're walking by a painting what they would see. And this kind of helps me, um, I think, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an artist thinking about architecture or space, I was able to kind of put these things together in a very interesting way. And I love to work with my hands and I, I respect Rashad's talking about um, his uh, craft and how he loves to work. Um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of his videos online are all about him actually doing things. And I prefer to do that because then you engage material, you engage the process uh, much, much more closely. So thank you. And, yeah. Now I'd like to invite um, all the rest of our panelists up for a discussion. So I thought, uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Rashad, Pierre, Francesco, Shonen. Um, for your very interesting presentations. And I think after seeing your work together, it's much more clear to me that the questions actually make sense. Um, it's not so easy always when you're not, you know, you don't intimately know someone's work, like how do you engage that? But I think the work is different enough, yet it also has a lot of commonalities. So before we actually get into the individual practices or work. I, I just thought that, I mean, some of you obviously would be interested and in know about kind of maybe design history or things that are related to architecture or art or furniture making, but I thought I'd just give you a very, very quick, quick one minute history of um, the changes in how design thinking or design practice um, has evolved over the years. And they're very broad and they're very, very quick. There's just, I think, a background that, that uh, you know, will help us understand uh, design thinking over time. Um, let's start with pre-industrial. If we go to pre-industrial revolution, what was it about? It was really about craft, individual craft, and how that individual craft was somehow marketed or sold or, or made for a certain purpose. Um, after pre-industrial, we went to industrial revolution, which really changed a lot. It was still about craft, but you had so many more people, you had a technology, and you needed to make it quicker, faster, better. It had to reach more people. Um, so the Industrial Revolution, uh, for me, was you know, a game changer in that way, where we look at design not necessarily as a kind of very individual thing all the time, but um, something that could be shared um, at scale. And uh, that also addressed a lot of complexities in terms of the changing environment at that time. So design was very much in tune, um, as architecture and many of the arts always are, to what's happening in the real world. We're always responding in some way um, in our practice. Um, so there's two ways in which one, um, one innovates 
uh, in regards to the idea of technology or craft or uh, you know these changes in environment and process. One is, very simply, you have a very evolutionary way of designing. That means you design a bottle and you make it slightly better over time and you change the shape a little bit and yet it's still, over 20, 30 years, it's still the same bottle. And that's a perfectly valid way of designing. And the second way is revolutionary design, where you really change the way, you know, somebody, so this is no longer just a bottle of drinking water, but this is a bottle now of um, filtering water and creating something clean out of something dirty. So that revolutionizes the same idea of the, of the bottle. Process is the same, you wanna drink water, right? So there are two ways of looking at process and technology in that. Now, after the Industrial Revolution, which had its own issues, it wasn't all great, of course, we know that, and that's a short history, so don't, don't, don't quote me on any of these. Um, Post-industrialization, there were a lot of questions in the fi late 50s and early 60s on how to get back to the idea of craft, how to look at artisanal projects, how to look at groups which were doing more bespoke work, how to take away from that idea of the anonymous and make it more, um, you know, make it more personal. And uh, this idea, of very, very specifically in architecture, if we look at it, I mean, that's what I know more about. But you had the big groups like, you know, Super Studio and Anagram, who are looking at collaboration. So collaboration became a big idea at this point, and it was about not just um, the Situationists. It became about architecture. It became about art. It became about graphic design and painting and product design and. People were all together somehow in this process. You know, they were making something. They were trying to change the world, actually. It became a social uh, initiative. Um, then we move into the 80s, and it was all about the market. It was about speculation, market, and the market started to rule process, which is uh, contentional because people who are kind of transitioning from this idea of the collaborative and the artisanal now move into a thing where they have to actually produce for the market again. And we get Massive globalization, right? So now everything's all over the world. You're producing for everyone all over the world, and there's like a, some kind of, I would say, a general idea of um, you know this being the most important aspect of design. But finally, I think in the last at least the last 10 to 15 years, we have slowly been moving back into this idea of a more of a kind of contemporary idea of design, and what that is is moving in. Uh, looking at maybe multiple approaches, again, the idea of collaboration is very important, but multiple, appro uh, multiple approaches and a kind of multidisciplinarity, cross-disciplinarity, in engaging the process of design and finding a way to, I guess, create end-user product or, or things like that. So, you know, it involves uh, many different things, it involves connecting more, it involves transforming, it involves adapting, uh, ideas um, from one field to another, ideating, and um, you know, in this regards, we could, I think, start the conversation here because now we are at the point. I think this is a good point to start in the present, uh, and then we can discuss the future. Um, do you guys look? How do you look at collaboration? You know, it's it not necessarily. It can be min many things. It can be between the craft. It can be between the craftsmen. It can be between the other disciplines or, or um, uh, consultants that you work with, or other practices like we've worked together. Or, you know, so w how does it play a role in each of your practices, the idea of collaboration? Um, so uh, collaboration is really at the heart of uh, the way we design today. I think that is becoming more and more common, this idea of a single principle uh, that seems to be diminishing more and more. I mean, we, like in our office, we have no fixed desks. I don't have a desk. Uh, I kind of flutter about between, and it's all, it's all about s these sort of collaborative discussions. And there's a lot of cross-pollination which happens just within the office. Then if we sort of widen the net and look outside of it, I think today we're in a, an amazing position where if research was shared like a little bit on a research cloud and because you know the thing is that pace of projects is very very high the pace at which we're working the pace at which we're producing and to do the research that has to be paired with it you know for us to innovate really um, one needs to be able to create platforms where we can where the research can be shared and we can then 
the only way I think it, it, we can still innovate at this pace is if we collaborate. Otherwise, it's it's impossible at at, the, at this rate to, for us to be able to still we'll we'll just innovation will start to sort of taper off in that way. We the, the com communication tools that we have for collaboration is amazing now. Um, I think one of the main things is that we what what we are trying to do now is sort of look at also the people who are making what we're intent like as artists and architects sometimes we have or more as architects we have the intention of what is to be made but very often and Rashad does this beautifully the inclusion of who is making it right rather than asking for like a, a, a crisp German wall from an Indian POP person so it, you know this this inclusion of the hand the inclusion of of the person so it, they're not just an executionary arm of an idea and that and I think that that is something that you know in Innovation happens in and of itself, and collaboration is is the is the is the act is just the, the medium for that. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes. For about the collaboration, I think that the um, main important uh, solution for uh, get the hope just get the product, get the design. Um, I like to much work with the people that give me more um, stimulus, give me more uh, stimulation for uh, uh, found the right solution. When I design something, when I design a um, product or maybe interior, I try to share my idea with uh, other people, especially with the craftsmen that they made the product. Because with them, I like to find the good solution without uh, um, maybe a simple idea. Sometimes maybe I uh, try to uh, found the idea that is very complex because uh, I don't know exactly with the solution for uh, uh, made this with the, um, uh, with the simple uh, solution by a craftsman. They have the tools, they have the idea that because they uh, work too much maybe in a different kind of a solution. So uh, we try to problem solve the problem together and uh, discuss with the different kind of uh, uh, the solution that we have. So when product, when uh, uh, interior design, when something is uh, just ready, is uh, a work for a lot of people that work behind this. Technician, engineer, uh, craftsman, and people that, uh, uh, also maybe other people, other people that are in your office because you can share with them and you can grow up the project. Uh, it's simple to design something and say that the product is very good because you design. So, uh, of course, this maybe is good for you, but maybe it's not good for the people. So I like to share with the product, share the idea with the other person and try to understand if it's really good for uh, the people is can, they can use. If there's um, the functionality that I won't give them, the, the idea that I won't transfer, is uh, good for them and can uh, have a potentiality on the market. So it's important that uh, uh, I won't understand, I won't listen, I won't feel the opinion of the other people and with them uh, I try to find the good finish, the good solution for all. I think for me collaboration works in quite a few different areas. Uh, for example, of course, there's a very strong understanding with the craftsman as well. Uh, more so because one, I'm not formally trained for furniture or uh, even understanding certain crafts. So sometimes when I identify a craft, uh, I'm really learning from them and kind of understanding what are the capabilities and then kind of altering uh, what can be done with that particular technique. So for example, when we did the embroidery on the wood, uh, once the technique was kind of established, uh, almost had about 20 different carriers at the uh, factory that I gave pieces of wood to and asked them to embroider anything uh, without giving them a design or a pattern just to understand what are the different kind of stitches possible. Uh, and that automatically created like an entire library for me, uh, which I feel in one sense is uh, amazing because there were so many things that I now extract uh, from this. It creates uh, a different way of working also in terms of understanding joinery, etc. So I think that's on one side where you look at uh, collaborations with uh, people you're working with. Uh, even within the office space, you know, to generate ideas, I think uh, within us it's quite uh, bottom top in a way. Uh, and that was something uh, which I find quite productive in the office that I worked at in New York. You know, the interns really collaborated uh, to the office space and coming up with ideas, brainstorming everyone, 
uh, together pitching uh, for what could be a solution to the problem at hand. Uh, you know, I share a space with my brother who is an architect as well, so uh, there's always a different kind of collaboration with his, uh, with him and not only him but also all the people who are working in his office because we all work together. Uh, so there's a learning also from uh, a different practice. Uh, so in that sense, I think there are different ways in which one uh, does collaborations internally as well. And then, of course, uh, in larger projects or things like that, you have consultants uh, that feed on to a project. Uh, that actually, just based on this idea of collaboration, we could also talk about, because it's very easy to say we collaborate and we're all architects and artists and furniture makers and, you know, um, that. But there's also, I mean, there's also a thought that disciplines are also specializations, right? So, my, I, just a question to you guys. Have you faced uh, this kind of um, resistance about the sharing of a kind of a specialization? Because let's say I'm practicing an architect and somebody else has gone to school for 20 years or they're practicing for the last 30 years, that that sharing of information somehow dilutes their participation or importance. I feel I face it a lot. Um, and it might have to do with this idea of sharing information, right? So have you guys faced something like that or faced issues of that? And how do you deal with them? Because I think if you have an open mind, you, anything is possible. If you also want to share your information, but when that, that gap or that wall is there, it, it, it affects the design process. So anything to say on that? I mean, I think right now we are very isolated from each other. Even as architects in the same pra in the same city, all practicing, there's not even enough sharing going on practice to practice. And there's so much that actually where a lot of small, medium-sized practices in Bombay, that if we had sh if we shared or if we had platforms and if we, as a profession, worked more cohesively, even just within architects, um, there would be so much more that we could we could do in that way. Um, there is that, that there is this sort of preservation of that I am I am the, the the author I'm trained to do this I do this but actually I honestly feel I very often learn from my clients and they have hired me to be the specialist and very often they bring things to the table or they create the debate and they create dialogue when you actually learn from that process um, there's certain certain people who you know who have because they might be an anthropologist or they might be a psychologist or they might have certain tech, technical understanding they might be a, a dentist so things which you which there are fields which you can learn from and if you if you're open to it it, it changes the game completely and it's very it, it's very strange that we, we come up against it all the time where people are protectionist about what they do and and the thing is that I don't. I think there's there's a certain amount of um, hesitation of you know someone um, that someone will just um, you know, call, yeah appropriate it without really uh, understanding it. But I think one has to sort of give that license to people and and allow for that to happen because what we're losing out on is far more from what uh, what could be you know what people are gaining from from is keeping themselves compartmentalized. This also, you can add this idea of piracy and other things also, like, you know, where I think when you have a product, you must have an issue also with thinking about that. Like, it's very easy to then, all of a sudden, somebody to copy your item and you said 10 years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, it's true. Uh, and this is a uh, very hard because, uh, uh, yes, the problem is that sometimes very uh, is difficult to share with uh, some people because you don't know exactly who is the the people thinking, and also to uh, to understand if they want to really help you or want only to catch some idea. Um, I know, but uh, in this case uh, you can um, uh, can go too much because I think that uh, it's important that you can. Uh, uh, you can uh, share the, the, the idea with other people. Now I think that there's a new kind of a shared idea. This is the social. Now with the social, everything shares something. You go on the Instagram, you go on the uh, Pinterest and all, and you can found every product. You can talk with the people, you can go in touch with the uh, other uh, architect or uh, interior designer, product designer, and ask more info, ask more, um, 
uh, news. It's absurd, but uh, it's more easy. It's more easy because there is a filter. The filter is the web. And you can talk with the people, maybe sometimes you don't know, but they uh, won't share. When you put something in the, on the web, you put something on the, you can share on the social. You won't transfer your idea. You won't transfer your message. It's very hard, maybe, you talk with some people near you. Is it more easy to share the idea with some people that don't know you and not with the people that stay close to you? In that case, uh, I think that uh, the social help us to talk, to share, to discuss with uh, some project. So sometimes you, uh, I, I contact the people by Instagram, by Pinterest. I try to understand what they do. I want to understand why they design that kind of product. And they explain me the idea. I talk with them, I explain my idea. And uh, maybe sometimes about this uh, uh, discussion, I try to design something. I have another um, instinct, no, for this. You know, just talking about uh, social media and also sharing, uh, when I developed the script for the pattern making, at some point I was stuck on that. And Rhino script has this open portal uh, where you can ask anyone any question and people reply. And I was actually surprised, like I wrote an email, like put it up on the website at night and by morning I had like two or three people who had worked on a file and even emailed uh, the script. So in that sense you're collaborating with people you don't even have a clue of. Uh, and of course, they do have their downsides as well as you're talking about with uh, piracy and duplication, especially when you're making products. But I think in some sense, things do always get copied. So I don't think that uh, is a way of limiting uh, what we do or try to uh, kind of keep it a secret because nothing's really a secret. Uh, you know, when I had my exhibition last month in February, uh, I had this chair and I literally launched and then I took a flight back to Bombay and before I landed, a friend of mine sent me a WhatsApp message. Some random vendor in Baikala had screen grabbed some of my images from Instagram and called it the Matrix chair and was selling it for 50,000 rupees. So first, I was really annoyed with that and then after half an hour I was like, there's nothing I can do and then I was like, maybe I should get in touch with him because if he's producing and selling at that price point, I'm clearly doing something wrong. So we've got it in touch with him, not yet told him that he's copied anything, but just to see what kind of quality can he produce because, you know, in some sense, maybe he could be a good resource. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so innovation, and we've been kind of you know, uh, talking about this um, throughout the presentations, but it's a critical part of each practice. Now, after seeing also your works, um, I've kind of, I mean, I've made my, my notes are a little bit all over the place, but um, uh, if, I, if I could say that there were, there's research, right? Um, there's technology, and there's also this idea of um, scale in some of Shonen's work. And the idea of change of perception. I think the idea of change of perception, for example, in your case, it was about the cork stool for me. You know, how you kind of just take something and you appropriate and you give it a different um, uh, idea. Uh, with you, Rashad, it's about the marble and the light bulbs. How you kind of mix a craft together with something and a material that you would never really um, you know, think of us, so you change the perception of that object. Um, uh, shonen, with you, I think it was about the, the brick and the idea of the assemblage of the building, so the idea of the installation or the art installation becoming eventually a kind of habitable structure or, or, or shelter. Um, how do you guys look at these different kind of innovations within your practice, and are there specific ones that you kind of work on more, or is it a series of kind of all of these things kind of mixed together on each project, on various projects? I mean, it's basically, an, I, I think, a, a question on innovation, but, um, uh, you know, like, research, craft, Technology. I mean, there there are very there are a lot of different things. Do they enter each other projects? 
but the, in each of the projects also kind of sometimes varied. Like one only looks at technology, one only looks at change of perception, one only looks at this. You know, typically, uh, sometimes projects don't give us the luxury of time to uh, always innovate. And so, in my downtime between projects, uh, especially in the office, we focus a lot on uh, R&D. There's a big focus on uh, material development, uh, for one, just because I'm interested in it, and we try to create different kind of uh, materials or techniques, and then they sometimes uh, just remain as a library uh, of studies that we've done. Uh, which then get appropriated uh, at some point of time. Uh, sometimes there are solutions that have come up uh, because of the nature of the brief. Uh, you know, it helps us research or go outside our comfort zone uh, to kind of look more into uh, finding a different kind of solution. And sometimes that in, you know, creates different kinds of innovation as well. Uh, but for me, specifically, uh, material becomes a very strong part about the practice. It's something quite... Uh, tangible, it's uh, something very accessible to uh, jump scales as well, uh, you know, from a small product to, at least within the interior scale. So far, I've not managed to make that same transition in any of the architecture projects that I do. I think the architecture side of my practice is very, very different from uh, the interior and the furniture side. Uh, and there's a different kind of conceptual rigor, I think, that translates there. Uh, but not in terms of the materiality or um, the other kind of research that uh, we focus on. So, uh, yeah, I think... Um, could, you scale anyway. up, could you scale up the, um, the, the, the furniture embroidery? Mm -hmm. Could you scale up to the Louboutin boutique? Could you scale it up to architecture scale? I, I mean, there would be, you need to see it also whether does it make even sense to scale it up to that size. You know, what is it producing uh, when that scale happens? So, uh, on one side, it shouldn't just be a one is to one translation. Uh, if it's adding something to the project, like in this case also it adds acoustical values or, or different kind of a cladding system. So, there is some benefit of making that leap from, you know, a smaller scale to the interior scale. Um, and for architecture at this point, um, that innovation has not happened. What are the Indian, we're, we're talking about this Indian innovation and Italian innovation. Um, are there specific things that you guys have looked at which are culturally specific? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, about the innovation. In, the, in terms of, for example, my project, uh, the innovation is uh, depends from different uh, uh, features. We have a different kind of uh, uh, solution for thinking about the idea of the project. No, sometimes the company come in my office and they ask me, "Okay, I found this." One time in uh, in fair, uh, I was there and one uh, one man come in the, my stand and say, "I found this product." But I don't know what this is. It's an aluminum foam. I, design, I uh, created this, but I don't know I can use. It's a new idea, but uh, the, character, the feature is that uh, you can use it for uh, uh, soundproof. It's very easy, like uh, filter the light. But uh, I can't use. I don't know what can do it. So uh, I try to understand with them exactly what you can do with this, with the, this material. And uh, then we can found the solution. But a lot of the times, for me, it's more easy to uh, work with the brief for the company. Because uh, the brief gives you some step. No? In that case, you can work with the focus on the project, then focus on the uh, function of the product that you want to do it. And then the innovation is in the uh, second step. When you can talk with the engineer inside, you can talk with the people that uh, resolve your problem. You are creative, we are the creative people, and uh, we work too much with the, the, our mind. We want to transfer the idea that we have in my mind by sketch and then talk with the company. The company has the people inside that work with you for complete and uh, made the project that you design. So this is a team, the people that work for that. They share, no? we saw before we talk about share. 
So it's important that the innovation is also in the quality of the, the product that you can uh, take using uh, absolutely what the, 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 the market uh, in, in that moment in the, in the, there is in that moment in the market. You talk about the Cox tool. Cox tool is a very simple idea. The innovation is only for uh, change the dimension, but uh, also use the good quality of the product. The first design, the first model that I design, I take the cork from the tree, I boil it, I fix, I impress, I work for one month for made only one piece. Then I looking for better and decide that there is a technology for found the cork, mix and uh, create the, the, the folder, that I, the layer that I fix and uh, I work later. That's more easy and uh, more fast to, to, to realize the, the product. For the handle was the same. We, you start with the idea. Then there are some people that help you to find the solution. The innovation stay also in the uh, software that you use. The software help you too much. The people, if you're thinking the people that work for uh, uh, the first time, like uh, Christopher Desser, no? He designed the, is one of the first uh, designer on the world as a, uh, a Dutch designer, and uh, he designed the um, uh, tea, uh, uh, the tea coffee, and something like this for in, uh, in um, silver, because in that case we had they work with the silver, and uh, they don't have too much machine. Every pieces they made by hand. Now we have a situation that the technology, the innovation is totally different. Now we have the 3D printer. Now we have the new material that we can use. Now we can uh, create with the software the shape that before is impossible to image because you can work with a different kind of, uh, uh, of, of shape also for creating the mold before it's impossible to do it. So the innovation is uh, to found the, uh, what the company sometimes they made. There is a big company as a material connection. Material connection is famous on the world because uh, they is a big best library of materials in the world. There is a seven point in uh, all the world. One is in Italy, but then is the USA, but also in, uh, um, in Asia. And uh, they have a lot of material that you can go there. Maybe sometimes you can use the web for understand what they have. Check, check the material and then use. And there are material that is stay there for a long time because uh, people don't know. Or people don't know can use. Very interesting, very, um, uh, very affectionate. I suggest to, to, to see this, uh, this library. So, uh, um, we, you know, it's been a real challenge. We, we were able to do the most uh, material research when we had very little work. And ever since we've had a lot of work, it's become harder and harder to actually do material innovation. Um, the innovations have become more in planning and more in, for instance, we're very close to saying with our clients uh, that we no longer need to put living rooms in homes. We're very close to sort of coming into to, to saying these things in our um, designs for homes. But those are other innovations, those are more planning innovations, innovations that have happened in, um, and you know, it, it's, it's interesting because one has to sort of, uh, s people believe in sustainability for, for their project when we're able to say that it really adds to the quality of life or the quality of experience and it adds that value. Um, so, so when things are, when we are able to correlate it to the, the experience, the social experience, the social play out, it, 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 it happens. But for, you know, even the bricks, it started when we started our office. Since then, honestly, we've not been able to do any of the kind of work that we would want to be doing in terms of research and, and material and innovation. And it, uh, we went to the point where we said, you know, we should have a separate cell for it. Like, we should have a separate, and it has to be run as a parallel activity, and then it cross-pollinates. And that's why I'm saying this sort of idea of like a research cloud that happens separately. And your projects are, and then uh, projects are happening at this insane pace these days. So one has to be able to do that, otherwise innovation starts to ebb away. It also becomes um, redundantly produced, which is there are several practices and they're all silos and they might be working on common ideas. 
and nobody has been able to implement or, or, or innovate enough to provide a solution uh, individually where you could actually do it um, together as a group or as a collaborative uh, body. So I, I mean, I think we've hit on some good big questions. I thought we should open it up a little to the audience. If there's anybody that would like to ask a question or make a comment. I just wanted, I was just wondering, do any of you work in the hospitality space at all? Like to create hotels, or rather living spaces as opposed to just hotels? Sorry. Hospitality. Uh, I, I, I will answer first. I have uh, worked in the hospitality space. It was a very difficult nine years of my life uh, for one project, but I, yes, of course, it's very dear to me also. We did uh, two projects, one in um, Pune for Marriott Courtyard, and um, one in uh, Bangalore at UB City for JW Bangalore. We did those two, those two hotels. I think that is interesting just as a question, not as the design, but uh, the process of designing those two hotels was very different from what I had worked on in terms of different projects, and collaboration takes on a different toll there. It, usually the architect and the builder design the structure, right? And you finish it, you complete it, you, you, know, you get it there, and then you go, let's hire an interior designer. And then the interior designer comes in and he designs the interior spaces, and he says, why did you put that beam there? And why did you put this column there, you're idiots? He says all this stuff, and then the landscape guy comes in at the end and just you know, waters the lawn. And they do this, they do this typically, no, I'm not, I, if there's a landscape, I'm sorry, no, I'm just. <laughs> I, I, this is, I'm just trying to make it light. But here, what, what, what we did was, we said that, okay, this is, this is a big project. There's no way that I want to um, assume that the landscape designer is going to just do this, and assume that the interior designer is gonna want this. So we started off, the idea was we started off right from day one, we hired a landscape designer, and we hired an interior designer, and we had, I was the architect. And we, all three of us, over a process of nine years worked on a project together, which, uh, frankly speaking, I think became, execution aside, uh, it came beautiful because we were able to understand each other's issues and what we wanted to do and redesign as the project was getting built. And uh, if you really see the way that the landscape interiors and the architecture integrated, there's a very holistic and common sensibility. And by far, I was the youngest person on the team and the less experienced, and uh, frankly speaking, I love their designs more than I, I would ever like anything that I do. Um, this guy, Vladimir Jurovic from Lebanon, he was a landscape designer, amazing, beautiful work, great guy, stubborn, very stubborn, wanted certain things and wanted it done like this, but, uh, but you know, he understood space. So he would say, I know what you're doing. And he would say, okay, let's do this together. Interior designer sat right next to me for six years. Um, we would constantly be just like passing sketches on each other's desks and what if I do this? Are you gonna get mad at me? You know, you know that kind of thing. And it, it, I think it was quite um, a nice process. Now we don't talk to each other, unfortunately, because I think nine years of being together has been a little too much. But um, any, anybody else? Hospitality? I, I would still work in the space, though. Hi. How do you all design for the future in an ecological sense? <laughs> no, design for uh, ecological. Yeah, well, uh, I think that uh, in the future there is the possibility that uh, um, there are more design, more um, uh, companies that are ecological oriented. But uh, in this moment, uh, uh, it's very so far because uh, um, for absurd, uh, if you want to talk about ecological on design, you spend more money than uh, made something that is not ecological. Because we are just ready. So uh, it's important that the people know you start to uh, talk about this. But uh, uh, every 
company that talk about the design ecological or sustainability, sustainability design. It's only for, um, yeah, uh, created the, the, the idea, uh, try to uh, thinking about the design, but uh, not now for, uh, for do this. For example, um, Adidas uh, presented the new shoes with the uh, bottles they take from the ocean. How much of the price for that shoes? So I don't know if uh, uh, in this moment is um, uh, we can create something with the, the ecological design, but it's important that the people started to do it. Uh, my first project, the Coxsoon, is uh, like ecological because it's, uh, take, we take part of the the Coxsoon, or maybe is a part of the work after the people created the stool, the the the, the cork from the champagne. The part that they, they remain, they mix and create the layer. So the layer is created by the same glue of the cork. The name is Suberina. Suberina is a, a natural glue from the, the cork. So in that case, is a, that product is for 95% 90, is ecological. But uh, it's very hard. The price is very, very, very high. The Chinese do the same with the... Uh, they usually is uh, less than 70% less than mine. But I think the ecological is nothing. So they use the resin, they use, uh, I don't know what to put inside. So uh, in the future, I think that we can work about uh, the ecological. Uh, there is uh, too much product that we can create, but uh, uh, now is very far. So there's actually a lot of work that's happened in this space. The problem is not really with the, the design aspect of it. I mean, there's a lot of people working in the space doing fantastic work. The problem is really in the intention of the industry and the intention of the consumer and why and how to add value to the idea of ecological, like what ecological means to a person and how do they translate that to real value to them? Why are they going to spend that much more? Or does it become a scale? where then the price of it doesn't, isn't what it is because it's trying to compete with mainstream industry. But essentially we have to, I mean, there has to be a full paradigm shift in terms of the meaning of it being ecological and what the value of that is and how do you replicate that, that value into money, right? Like well, how do you make that sort of um, correlate? Because till then we're not going to be able to, we're all interested in working in ecological spaces. We, why wouldn't we be? Everyone is. But to understand the value of it, for it to actually be equated into real life in real terms, um, until that happens, it's not going to become a mainstream. The cost of it not being ecological has not really permeated yet. There's also, um, you know, en environmental ecology is one and sustainability is one, but I, I personally feel like social, the social ecology of, um, of design and, 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 and also design and entrepreneurship and innovation uh, is, is equally as, Im as important. And, um, you know, as an architect, I have worked on a project like a Leeds project, you know, where you have to do a Leeds building. I mean, we have followed all the rules, we have done everything, we have gotten a rating certificate, but really, is that a sustainable building? No, it is not. It, it, yes, it has some materials which prevent a certain amount of heat gain, and it uses insulated wall, and it uses recycled fly ash, and it does that, that's great. It's better than the building that doesn't. But is that truly what sustainability is, or you know, is it adding value to that environment? I think on a very minuscule level, it is more kind of a, uh, you know, just a kind of a, a, a rating that's given to be able to sell something to somebody, and that's again the idea of the market kind of taking over that. So I think we have to get back to a true idea of sustainability. There are many architects that are also working in this. There are many designers. Um, that do work with sustainability on a core level and whose work is truly, I think, sustainable, you know, um, throughout... Uh, and Tilla got like some crazy lead rating, but it's like... A yeah, hobby. but that, exactly. So what happens with the social ecology? What, and Tilla is not socially ecological, right? Because... <laughs> right, but it's, it's, it's... By the rating system, it is. So, I mean, there's many different things. Like, 
on the on the on the other level, as in like a project I've not um, presented today, is my brother and I decided to start a business, and we're saying we didn't start a business with the idea of making money, but we said, you know what, we need to make something. Hopefully, it'll be successful, but make something that initiative is the idea that the profits, a portion of the profits that go from that, go back into why we're starting the project. So you know, we're doing something for children. So then, and we are all influenced and inspired by our children. So if we're doing something with children, make it part of the core idea that you take the money back and you, and you spread it out through organizations that deal with children's education and welfare and all. So that was the actual initiation idea. So that, for me, is very important. For him, he's more of a business person, but he understands what I'm saying. So social ecology for that is, 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 is I think, is very, very critical. The, the, the product is not necessarily environmentally friendly or it's not made out of biodegradable material or anything like that. Yes, it doesn't use children to make it, it doesn't, use, you know, those things are very strict. But I think it's a larger thing about kind of giving back in another way. So there are many different ways you can look at, um, you know, ecology. Uh, how serious, this is something what Rushad had touched upon, how serious is the issue of plagiarism in design and how does one tackle it? No, on a more serious note, I, I don't know how one can uh, control plagiarism. I, I think also in some sense, uh, we, as even consumers in India, we are all party to it as well. In so many of my projects, which I wouldn't be very proud of, but we have bought things which are made in China and bought because sometimes our clients want not the originals but the fakes. Uh, and so I think there are different levels where uh, we are all party to that as well. Um, but I think it's only once the consumer end stops that uh, that could be tackled. Uh, there will be people making those fakes and until uh, we stop wanting them uh, or make a conscious effort to not put them in our projects or not indulge. Uh, that market. I think that would be the only way to uh, stop it. Okay. Thank you, guys, for the interesting presentations. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you again, Avid and the Avid team, Assad, for having us. We'd like to thank um, Rushad, Pierre Francesco, Shonan, and of course, Rajiv. Um, for being here and giving us a very rigorous and interesting discussion. Um, thank you to the Italian Embassy Cultural Center Mumbai for collaborating with us to bring you all this. Thank you to our online and offline audience for being here and being engaged and taking the conversation forward. And we have many more workshops coming up um, on design, on photography, um, on screenwriting, so do stay tuned to Avid on our social media platforms and remember learning never stops. Thank you.